Welcome back to Selling Your Business with David King. I'm David King. I'm the author of Selling Your Business, Begin with the End in Mind. And today we have the immense pleasure of being joined by Bill Snow. Bill is the author of Mergers and Acquisitions for Dummies. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, David. appreciate you having me on. How are things in Chicago today? It is absolutely beautiful. Perfect day today. Uh, great. I hope you got a big weekend in store for you. <laughs> Always do. Yeah. So Bill is also managing director at Jordan Knopf, and he's an investment banker in the field of mergers and acquisitions. And Bill's book, as I mentioned, is Mergers and Acquisitions for Dummies. And he's going to reach through and sign it for me right now. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I'm <laughs> reaching out. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, Bill. My book is Selling Your Business, B Begin with the End in Mind. Um, it's it's shorter than your book. And with the Begin with the End in Mind, it also goes back to the first day of, of, a, of starting a business because there's so many mistakes that, that business owners can make along the way that, well, we, that's going to take a little bit off the price when you get there. So, but even though you just, yours is about mergers and acquisitions, yours, your book is longer than mine. It's got a <laughs> variety, it's got a variety of different topics. And it's funny that, you know, there, there's so much more to say about mergers and acquisitions than other types of deals. Um, if if there were a book about initial public offerings, I don't think anybody would read it because it's just not <laughs> there's not that as many things to say. And mergers and acquisitions, it's kind of like watching the movie Pulp Fiction. You've seen Pulp Fiction uh, more times than you will ever know. Yeah, I right. know that frontwards and backwards, of course. Yeah. And there's so many different stories there that somehow weave all together as one quite different, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, then it's yeah. all just kind of bound together. That's kind of like a selling your business. How's it going to happen? Well, sit down and just watch. This is going to be interesting. Yeah. So uh, first off, Bill, tell us about yourself, your career, how you got where you are today. Sure. Sure. Happy to talk about that. So I've been doing middle market investment banking since 05. Prior to that, I bounced around all over the place, ended up getting a lot of business uh, acumen and experience and so forth. Everything from sales jobs. I was with a publicly traded retailer and, and we were buying up mom and pop video retailers, not Blockbuster, a long, long time ago. So I was operating those. Worked for angel funded startups and uh, venture funded startups, tried to play the venture game and was just pounding my head against the wall. I wrote a book that I gave away for free. It was, a, it was supposed to be an article. I didn't even know who was going to publish the article. I just had this idea in my mind, and I put it in a PDF, gave that away. It was a little booklet. I wove a narration through it. I claimed that I used Keith Richards' guitar tuning as a paradigm for venture capital, which I kind of do, but I thought that was a little unique and different. And I gave that away for free, and it went all over the internet. I was a very, very minor viral hit before viral hit was a term. I didn't know what to do with it. And as luck would have it, I segued into middle market investment banking. A former colleague was at a firm and they recruited me. And a few years after I gave that little booklet away for free called Venture Capital 101, Wiley Publishing contacted me. They wanted to write a book. And it's kind of interesting. You were talking about who would buy a book, uh, IPOs for dummies, and they wanted to do LBOs for dummies. And I think they've done that. And I was I was flattered they reached out to me. Uh, but I thought, well, LBO, leverage debt, that's a form of paying for business. Very interesting. But I thought maybe we should broaden this. And so I came up with M&A for dummies. And they thought that was a terrible idea. And then two years later, they called me back with a new idea, M&A for dummies. And so I wrote the first edition in 2010 came out in 2011. And then just this past year, we did the second edition, which just came out at the end of May this year. There's a lot of topics that wouldn't make for good books. <clears throat> a friend of mine from back at Wilson Sonsini said the shortest book that's ever been written is uh, Successful Joint Ventures. <laughs> so, yeah. so everybody's yeah. got an idea but generally the the, the merger is also and people go, looking to yeah. go to, to business school 
we're telling you this is interesting. If you want a rewarding career, it's not going to be easy, but this is probably a, a good rewarding career with a lot of different aspects to it. Fair enough? It it, it can be. Um, I, I think people sometimes have a, a their, their view of this business is askance. They, they, I don't know, think it's exciting, open outcry, like we're a stock market. And I hate to break it to, to all the break the news to all the kids who want to get into this, all the, the college kids or people in their, their 20s thinking about doing this. It's not that exciting, okay? It's a lot of quiet work and staring at your computer, doing a lot of analysis. But before that, you have to get the client. And so how do you get that? That's that's a whole other a book and a whole other uh, podcast that we could get into. Then you have to execute the transaction. That's what I started off doing. So I would disseminate the materials and uh, set up the meetings, get the offers, negotiate the deals, and, and get it across the finish line. The, the biggest skills that you need if you want to do this kind of work is accounting. And I, I challenge young people. Some people take me up on this. Some don't. Take a balance sheet, an income statement from a publicly traded company, get a starting point, an ending point, and then create a cash flow statement just from the balance sheet and income statement as a test to see if you've got enough accounting skills. So you want to have good accounting skills. You want to have good math skills. So if you struggled in high school in algebra, certainly calculus, we use mostly algebra. If you don't like math, this isn't your, your, your job. If you don't like to write, if you're not good at conveying ideas uh, concisely and accurately uh, in writing, this isn't going to be your job. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of math. It's a lot of accounting. And then, of course, beyond that, when you negotiate, it's it's being able to negotiate. And to that end, if you're not playing cards with your friends in college and learning some skills at the poker table, doesn't have to be big stakes. Mm -hmm. But if you're not learning how to read your hand in comparison to what you think other people have, uh, you're going to struggle at this kind of work as well. It's funny, the, the first thing you mentioned is accounting, and, and I do, I've got a bit of a concern about future business in America, because there's just frankly not enough people who are willing to study accounting these days. Young people today want to study more of uh, the computer science and be a programmer or do something different than accounting. It's not drawing people, and the accounting firms are having a, a hard time Filling. I, I I was a CPA before uh, going to law school, and it wasn't glamorous. It was drudgery every day, yeah. but I yeah. use it every day today in what I do. And if people you you pick up people's books that you know, it, I, I you know it, it can really harm the value of a business just because you haven't been investing in your accounting all the way. Um, so it's a I, I see it as a an imminent you know issue for for yeah. america to confront it's yeah that, that, that's a good point uh at least the kids that are going to school if they're studying computer science and programming i think those are good tracks for them because they'll be able to find work and obviously we're demanding more and more on the on, on the tech end but yeah you're, you're right i mean accounting well i make a joke uh about accounting good naturedly because i i'm not a, a cpa but I'm, I'm quite good at it and I always do this when I'm speaking to a group of accountants and they love it because I'm making fun of them, but they're so happy that someone's talking about them. They look at each other and say, well, look at that. He's talking about us. And, and the joke is, how do people become accountants? They go off to college and they ask somebody, what kind of job can I get where I don't have to talk to people? And someone says accounting and they say, hot dog, sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and they're very, very happy. And then they're doing very well. And then the old people bring them into an office and they say, you're doing great. We're going to promote you. And the accountant says, hot dog, what does that mean? Well, we're going to make you a partner. Well, hot dog, what does that mean? You have to go out and talk to people and bring business in, and then they curl up in a fetal position and cry. So that's kind of the life cycle of the accountant. The 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 definition of a tax attorney is that someone who didn't have the personality to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, we, we'll stop kicking yeah. around accountants. So with your uh, investment banking work that you do today, what what's your sweet spot? Are you industry agnostic, any particular size? Yeah, we are middle market or lower middle market, depending on how you want to define it. So it's typically been 10 million to 300 million in revenue. In the past, it's been at least a million of EBITDA. So all you kids that are thinking about being investment bankers, if you don't know what EBITDA is, you better study. And by the way, it's 
this is a little plug for my book. It is described in the book. Uh, so it's been a million EBITDA, but I think now a lot of things have, have changed. And sometimes it's difficult to find buyers for those smaller deals. So we want to see at least 2 million in EBITDA. Uh, industry agnostic, I'm in the Midwest. Not surprisingly, I've done a lot with manufacturers, distribution businesses, some business services uh, has been the focus, but it's, it's been more for me casting a wide net and I want to be able to bring in as many opportunities as possible and then have other colleagues at the firm work on who might have some specific industry domain experience and knowledge, be able to work on those, those transactions as I bring them in. It, it's funny. I mean, I, I've worked on $2 billion deals and $200,000 deals. Uh, sometimes they can be just as difficult to close a really small deal as as it can be a huge deal. It, it, it kind of the, yes. the economies of scale here make, make it hard for, for sm small business owners to get the professional services they need to really pull their chips off the table. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, sometimes those smaller deals require more handholding and pounding the table and, and pushing to find the buyer and get the thing across the finish line just because a smaller company is going to have more risk than a large company, a $5 million EBITDA business. If it has a downturn and loses a million dollars in earnings, well, that's painful, but it's probably not going to go out of business. A million dollar EBITDA business who loses a million dollars in earnings, they're in trouble. And so you have more room to work with. And I think a lot of business owners sometimes struggle to understand that. It's kind of counterintuitive, but the check is the amount of work needed to get the big deal done and the little work, the little deal done is going to be about the same. And so that's why the fees, the, the amount of work is the same. The transaction is smaller. So yeah, you know what? The fees might be larger on a percentage yeah. basis. That that might not seem fair to the business owner. And I get their complaint, but I can't cut the fee by, you know, uh, one half or eighty percent. You know, if if the transaction took one half the amount of time to get the smaller deals done, okay, maybe we could get by on fifty percent of the normal fee. Right. But they're probably going to take as long if not longer. And it's, it's exactly. maybe not fair, but it's the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the beast. They're just still, you, you can't cut corners on the work that needs to be done to get a buyer and seller and negotiate, document the whole thing, pull the due diligence and close a deal. It just doesn't happen. There's no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's take a, a generic business, say a, a $50 million uh cheese head manufacturing business in Milwaukee, uh, right around the corner from you. And uh, when do they usually show up on your desk? When do you meet them? You know, T minus when do you start working with a company like that, that makes boxes for cheese heads? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a booming business in Wisconsin, I think. So they're, you know, as long as they're getting in the, the cheese curd business as well, they should be in good shape there. Yeah. It really depends. I'll, I'll give you the uh, detailed MBA answer. It depends. Okay. And, and sometimes you meet somebody and they're ready to go. Maybe they're interviewing other banks. Quite often we get referred to deals through referral partners, lawyers, accountants, wealth managers, commercial bankers, maybe a few others. That's been the, the main thrust of my marketing. And so we get introduced to them and sometimes they're ready to go. Sometimes they're just kicking the tires and there's nothing wrong with that. So it's it's really difficult uh, to say with with an absolute blanket statement. So, you know, some, like I said, sometimes it's just a few weeks or a couple months. I have things that I've been chasing for seven, eight years. I've been buying a foursome at a charity golf outing because of the business owner who I know, and I'd like to get his business. It's a good charity. I'm happy to support it. It supports our veterans. Uh, but that's been going on for, you know, seven, eight years. I, I take him out golfing and trying to develop that relationship. So sometimes it's quick and sometimes it goes on for, for years or a decade. Okay. And, but in an ideal situation, would you say uh, you need about this much time to properly do uh, your work? You know, the preparatory work, T, t minus closing, a, a, a year, two years? Uh, if, if they're ready to go, probably about nine months, give or take. Okay. Yeah. And do you sometimes, you know, this happens to me, you know, when working as an attorney, 
Beatles would just show up on my desk. Oh, we already signed this letter of intent. Don't worry. It's not binding. Yeah, it's not binding and it's not getting any better either. But yeah. boy, here yeah. we are. Do you ever get deals that where you get a relatively short fuse and it's even locked and loaded that you don't get a whole lot of rework on the letter of intent? Well, no, that hasn't happened. I'm the one writing the letter. Of, Good, well, I mean, I mean, I'm the yeah. one negotiating with the client, and so I'm the yeah. one negotiating uh, the letter of intent. We'd like to bring the lawyer in and get the yeah. lawyer's blessing and and the, have the lawyer's input. Hey, you guys should do it like this instead of like that, which is is very very valuable. Uh, clients sometimes don't want to do it, and it's it's pushing a string trying to get them to bring the lawyer in. Why lawyers have this thing called billing? If you heard about this where they, they want to charge for their work. Isn't that a crazy yeah. thing? They want to get paid for doing good work. Uh, so a lot of times the, the business owners don't want to do that, which I think is, is a mistake, but ideally we do get the lawyers involved. Are you seeing, speaking of those damn lawyers, are you seeing a, lot, seeing a lot of them moving more towards fixed fees so there's not so much tension over paying to get the work you need? I, I, I've seen I've seen both. and. Yeah. It you know really really depends on the deal and and so yeah. forth. So, that, so there's some lawyers I know that will work on a fixed fee and and uh, you know that's nice knowing that what it's going to be. Uh, and there's there's others that are going to going to bill at whatever their their rate is. They're usually pretty right. good at at estimating how much time is going to be needed, uh, how much time they're going to put in as a senior partner, how much the uh, other junior partners or paralegals are going to be involved with doing it. You know, the, the one the one trick is if something happens in the transaction, no fault of the investment banker, no fault of the lawyer, maybe the business takes a downturn or there's some sort of delay that is out of our control, mm -hmm. you know, that that can impact uh, the amount of work that that is being done. But yeah, I'll leave that to the, the lawyers to negotiate that. Yeah. And when you have a client or do you typically have a, a, a plan of what sort of transaction that you're going to pursue or, or is it a variety of different things? I, I, I may sell to a strategic buyer. I may give to my three sons. I, I may, you know, also, you know, sell a portion of the business, just take a capital infusion do you kind of consider a, a range of alternative transactions? Ideally, when we go to market, we want to know what the client wants to accomplish. Yeah. And and going to market saying, because I've had clients and, and that have said, oh, we'll do whatever the buyer wants. I'm flexible. I can do whatever. And, mm -hmm. and they're and they're trying to be helpful and open minded. And that that's great. But as someone who's also written LOIs, because I also do some buy side work, mm -hmm. Writing that LOI is difficult when the business owner says, well, I'll do whatever you guys want or, you know, whatever. You know, we need to know something. Do you want to sell all of it? Do you want to sell a portion? Do you want to hold on to it? Do you want to sell the, the company over some period of time? Do you want to stay involved? Are you looking to retire? Uh, have you talked with your tax people? You know, you talk just kind of backing up a little bit. Some of the things that a business owner can do to prepare. Have they talked with their tax advisors? about yeah. what is the preferred structure. Of course, everybody thinks assets and uh, do an asset deal or a stock deal, but mm -hmm. understanding that, but have they actually crunched the numbers? I call it the yeah, yeah, yes, because I've dealt with this enough. The business owner calls up the, the tax person and the tax person kind of dismissively waves the hand. Yeah, 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 do a stock deal, you'll be fine. And, and maybe the stock deal is is fine. Maybe it's not, maybe the asset deal, mm -hmm. maybe there is little or no difference, but I implore business owners to have their people crunch the numbers, look at it, look at things like accounts receivable. Is that going to be taxed at a different rate than conveying mm -hmm. the other assets of the business? Things like that. It really depends on, on the corporate structure and the basis in the assets, the basis in the stock. Um, and so if they can do that, that is a huge help. Hopefully they're also working with a wealth advisor, somebody who can help them manage the money after the deal's done. Uh, that person might have some ideas too in terms of structuring the deal that might be preferential for the seller. It's great when you get to the eve of the sale and they say, what can I do to, to cut the taxes? I'm like, well, what could you have done is the yes. question. That ship yeah. sailed two years yeah. ago in terms yeah. of what we could have done. Yeah. On many of these issues. Absolutely. Tell great. me about uh, EBITDA and why adjusted EBITDA has become uh, like a Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> you, Tell me you, must have, you must have read the book cover to cover. So you, you, <laughs> I did. <laughs> you, you, you probably know it better than me. I only wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. The, 
EBITDA, and I, I talk about this in the book, is is a you know it's not GAAP, it's not official uh, right. accounting, generally recognized accounting principle practice, whatever they're they're calling it these days, mm-hmm. and and it's something that was invented by an executive as some sort of measure of a business as if it was operating in a vacuum, if it didn't have to pay taxes, if it didn't have to borrow money and pay interest, if it didn't have to uh, buy equipment and amortize that cost, that capital cost over some period of time and so forth. So it strips away all of those things. And what was what, what, what is the business generating if it was operating in a vacuum? Okay, you know, that, that that's pretty reasonable. Certainly it is the de facto way or kind of the underpinning of uh, valuation. The adjustments to EBITDA, those are, of course, one-time only expenses, uh, owner-related expenses, expenses the owner claims will go away after a sale is done. And that can have some validity. But what happens is a lot of times business owners understand this. And so they're throwing everything in the kitchen sink. And well, this is a, a one-time only expense. This is a one-time only expense. As we tell them, if every single month you have $20,000, $30,000 in so-called one-time only expenses, but every single month, maybe it's different expense, but every month you're having that kind of expense, a, a buyer is going to say, wait a minute, this really doesn't go away. This might be an assortment of different expenses, but it really doesn't go away. I'm going to be incurring, pick the the topic or pick the, the, the specific expense. I'm going to be incurring this every single month. And so they're going to battle about that. And so that's why it's become, in my mind, kind of a Frankenstein's monster where we, the investment bankers, if we're so smart, we're the smartest people in the room, and you'll know this because we'll tell you, we've created this. Let's add back. And sometimes add backs are legitimate, but it has mm-hmm. become a bit of a monster because I do think sometimes people overuse it and try to claim things that are one time only or go away when they really don't. Yeah, that, that can be a sticky part of the deal to 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 break it to owners that with these add backs, we, we're hoping to get aren't going to fly yep. uh, with the other side here. Um, and you uh, look past the numbers to determine a, a company's true value. Um, it's great. I had a, a really interesting uh, guest a few weeks ago, Mac Lackey, uh, who's uh, who's owned several businesses that he sold. And he was talking about how it's not it's not primarily the numbers that determine a value to a buyer. They're looking for the other, you know, the, the innovations, the team that what do you see as the drivers of a company's valuation? It's not just dollars and cents. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's it's kind of difficult to define that. Certainly, in a one size fits all approach, the way that we look at valuation, we'll do a valuation exercise. We don't share this with the buyer. This is just for internal discussions with the business owner, and we'll look at uh, comparable transaction. We'll look at market comps, what publicly traded companies are trading at, and then we make some adjustments for for size. We'll do a LBO analysis, leverage bio analysis, and then we'll do the the favorite financial uh, 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 calculation of every college mm-hmm. student, the discounted cash flow. Oh, they love doing the DCF. And those are value that we'll blend the, those four together. Probably a lot of other firms do that or something very similar. That for me, and we don't publish that. We don't say, here's a $30 million enterprise business. Give me your best offer, right? That's just for our internal uh, understanding. But that's an academic exercise. And Mm -hmm. what you're talking about is the strategic imperative. That's a term that my firm has. And I think it's a great term. Mm -hmm. A strategic imperative to do a deal. So, yeah, we want to look at the revenue and the the profit, of course. But does the company solve, does the product offering maybe plug a hole in the buyer's product offering? Or is it a big competitor that's become a pain point? Things Mm -hmm. like that. Uh, is it rapidly growing? Even a company that might have a concentration, which could be an issue for a lot of buyers, but another buyer might come in and say, well, we don't do any business with that company that where that big concentration is. And we've been trying to get in. And so that's actually, we can pay more. We're not, the buyer's not going to tell us that, of course, but they could pay more than maybe another buyer because that concentration issue basically goes away because it solves a problem for them. So if there's some sort of strategic imperative, something beyond the numbers, where a business absolutely has to make the acquisition, that's where you can see some really compelling valuations. So <clears throat> along that line here, when you're putting a, a company to the market here, are you 
typically considering the range of buyers, strategic buyers, uh, you know, uh, private equity firms, other and other financial buyers. Sure. Or do you generally say you with this type of business and get the stage you're at right now, you're probably going to be best uh, and get the highest value if we can find the right strategic buyer for you? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and and it really depends. We'll we'll go after all. We'll talk to the strategic buyers. We'll talk to private equity firms, depending on the size of the deal. Uh, we know a lot of firms that are smaller, kind of quasi private equity. They don't have limited partners, but it's a partner or a couple guys, a couple gals, and thrown some money together, and they they buy companies. Uh, you'll have to excuse the the common term, and just cool stuff, things that we we like, cool yeah. little companies. So. Uh, they might be a viable buyer as well. Um, and so it really depends on what the what the owner is looking to do. If they want to cash out completely, probably strategic, just forget the numbers for a moment, that might be better. If they're looking at maybe selling a piece of the company, working for a few more years, and then selling again, maybe working with a partner who can help with acquisitions or help make investment and make make the business worth more over the next few years, maybe a private equity firm is going to be the uh, you know, sell a piece to the private equity firm, build it up a little bit, and in three, four, five, six, seven years, sell it maybe to a strategic, and and get a the so-called second bite of the apple. So it starts with what the seller wants to do. What is the seller trying to accomplish? Create liquidity, retire, bring in a strategic partner to help expand the business. There is no right or wrong. It really depends what the seller wants to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And if if we're gonna get into the the financial buyers, you're gonna get the the more complicated deal terms with you know carried interest and that the, those sorts of pieces to it. The and if you're getting different types of offers in there, then it's not just apples and oranges. You may get a peach, a plum, a pear, and all these. And then then putting them on the table together for for the for the seller to consider. That's kind of okay, well, holy macro. What? How do these equate to each other? Do you have to kind of run some algorithms for people? <laughs> Here's what might happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called uh, analyst. Uh, figure this out. So yeah, uh, we'll we'll spread the numbers. I mean, it's obviously under my direction, but. We will put all those offers on a spreadsheet, and then you want to quantify everything. How much cash at close is a note included? How much interest is being paid? If they're you know a million dollar note paying seven percent, well that's seventy thousand a year. You know you add that. That's you got to put the money somewhere, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Business Owner, Miss Business Owner. Maybe keeping a small piece in your business and earning a a good return on it. Maybe that makes sense. You know, to to keep some of it there. Looking at uh, earnouts, you know, those make me a, a little nervous. That you, you see that more and more, um, mm -hmm. but we have to quantify that as much as possible. Are they offering some stock? So you want to take some estimations of all those and look at all those components and then talk about it each deal. Who do you, you know, what do you feel best about? You know, a large PE firm, you're probably going to feel pretty good about them closing because they probably have the capital. You can see all the other transactions they're doing versus, uh, an individual or, or a couple people trying to buy a business and they're trying to scrape together a little bit of money that they have and borrow money from friends and family and so forth. And those deals get done. And we've sold mm -hmm. companies to those sort of people. But you have to look at all those pieces and then understand what is the seller? What are you looking to accomplish? And have you been talking with your tax people? Because quite often that big number, I call it the country club number. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we sold our business for, you know, whatever, seven times, eight times, 10 times. Well, that's great. That's the country club number. That's what you use to brag about it. The the guy next to you in the in the locker room. But what did you walk away with? And in that regard, sometimes when you look at that that gross amount, the total amount before all the other expenses might be very different than the net. And I think that the business owners also should be looking at the net amount, what they get after they pay off any debt, after they pay Uncle Sam's going to show okay. up and take what a third roughly. Uh, I get paid lawyers get paid, all those sort of things factor in. There might be a working capital adjustment. After all those things, what does the business owner walk away with? And in that regard, maybe a deal that has a lower gross amount mm -hmm. is better than the higher gross amount because at the net, may, maybe depending on a lot of different factors, maybe that lower gross amount yields a higher net and that would be a better deal in mm -hmm. that regard. July 7th, 2023. What are what kind of market are we seeing out there right now? Where's where's it hot? Where's it cold? Who's who's making off uh, nicely today and who's uh, maybe staying yeah. back? Yeah. 
Well, that, that's a great question, and that comes up all the time. What does the market look like? And as I point out to people, the market at M&A, like any other market, is divided into buyers and sellers. And in that regard, the demand from buyers, strategic buyers, mm -hmm. private equity firms, and so forth, remains very, very high. I get called and emailed on a daily basis, usually from PE firms. They want to talk about what they're looking for. And of course, they want to hear what we have in the pipeline. The challenge is and always has been and probably always will be enough supply. Business owners willing to go to market, uh, those with a good company and reasonable expectations. As I tell people, if you have a, a good company and you have reasonable expectations about price and the structure and so forth, you probably stand a really high chance of getting a really good deal. Mm -hmm. And and to that extent, that's always the challenge because those good companies don't trade very often. You call up a 45-year-old business owner, married, happily married, spouse is happy, they've got kids, are happy, health is good, person enjoys the work, jumps out of bed in the morning. I can't wait to get to work in the morning. I love what I do. I make a lot of money. I've got a nice bank account. You can't offer that person enough money. To buy the company they're not i don't care how strong demand is from private equity firms that person's going to say i already do what i love what am i going to do with myself and mm -hmm. so that puts some upward pressure on price for those who do want to want to step in so if you have a good company and you want to go to market this is a wonderful time the, the amount of demand from the buyers is still extremely high great news great news so uh, on the fear side, and maybe just the precautionary side, what, what sort of common mistakes do you see most often? What, what are the true deal killers out there? Yeah, the, the mistakes that I see is, and, and these are not necessarily a, a deal killers. Well, the, the big deal killer is, is failure to plan for taxes. Okay. And, and I, I implore any business owner who's watching this, talk to your tax people before you hire somebody like me to sell your business and understand uh, structure, understand do you want to sell stock or assets, have them actually do the calculations. Don't let them just say, yeah, 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 you want to do a stock deal. Maybe the stock deal is better, but you want to understand that as a accounts receivable being taxed at a different rate. You want to understand all of that. Ideally, you want to have audited or reviewed financials for two years, not one year, two years, because mm -hmm. one year is the accountants have just uh, observed inventory at the end of the year. So they're going to give you a qualified opinion. We're taking the word of the business owner that the inventory value was X mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year. We didn't observe. Sure. How does that impact the business? Well, when you can observe at the beginning and the end, that's why you need two years. That helps solidify the cost of goods because you have a real handle on inventory, what's come in, what's gone out, what the actual cost of goods are. And if you understand your cost of goods sold, obviously that's going to flow to the bottom line. So two years of audited or reviewed financials. Uh, the big one today also is do a sell side quality of earnings report. I implore business owners because we talked about the Frankenstein's monster, the adjustments to EBITDA, audits and reviews set up EBITDA. A quality of earnings report will set up adjustments to EBITDA, and that is going to quantify addbacks due to owner-related expenses, excessive owner comp, you know, normalized owner comp, uh, truly one-time only expenses that go away and so forth. Well, Bill, I think we're running out of time here. Are you, are you this, this is the second edition, correct? That is correct. Okay. And your your next uh, book is going to have Fabio on the cover. It's going to be a little bit more of a romance novel. Hey, after I sold my business, I, I went away. <laughs> well, it's it's great that you mentioned that because <laughs> Wiley Publishing, when and my my PR firm, when they heard I was talking to you, the famous David King, they said, "See if he'll pose for the next cover." So I'm putting you on notice right now that we okay. want you on the next cover. Yeah. All right. I'm hitting yeah. the gym after this. Okay. All right. Well, I tell you, I, I really sincerely hope uh, that, that your bears uh, get back in business <laughs> and, 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 and your Cubs, do, you know, turn it around. Um, and when I come to Chicago, we are on for some poker and don't take every penny I've got. I still got to put my kids through college. I, I, I'm, I'm happy. Just uh, just bring a lot of money. I'll teach you how to play. Uh, We'll no, no, that's great. <laughs> right. David, definitely when you're in town, look me up. It would be great to get together. And I really appreciate Absolutely. You talking. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Great having you. And thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Selling Your Business with David King.